rest of the tornado hunt team on the move there in the right towards some very, very dark skies and in some rain, obviously, with the windshield wipers going. Uh, let's hope that they're not uh, doing uh, what we call sometimes entering the bear's cage, coming out of the rain right into uh, a rain-wrapped tornado at this point. Members of the District of Columbia National Guard deployed to support government officials and district residents during winter storm Jonas. Soldiers and airmen dispatched to various locations around D.C., providing support using military vehicles to transport supplies and essential personnel. The district guardsmen also helped emergency response vehicles and civilians trapped in the And left a trail of debris in the city of Kwashigaya. Video footage shows what appears to be a tornado. Firefighters and police say the powerful winds ripped through parts of the city and damaged more than 300 buildings. To 100 meters across, it was one of the largest tornadoes ever in Japan. Scientists at Japan's meteorological agency have surveyed the damage. They've determined the tornado's strength. They say it measured one or higher on a scale between zero and five. The scientists say a level one tornado packs winds of about 120 to 175 kilometers per hour. The Vatican knows, and I have some local uh, connections there that I know how, about the Vatican and what they're doing. The Fortune 100 companies, they're getting ready and being prepared. Creative forensics when it comes to secrets and how military intelligence knows about things before they happen. Because of what I do and what I do professionally, I interact with people involved with law enforcement, including the FBI. Would the federal government of the United States of America lie to you? Creative forensics. Of course they would. And they have for decades. Creative forensics. My first-hand awareness began in, in year 2000. Two different men, friends of mine, they're both researchers. They approached me and they said, John, there's this thing that's going to happen. We're not sure about the date. What's going to happen, it's going, when it does, there's going to be abrupt climate change, there's going to be 200 mile an hour wind. I need to find out if this is true. And my confidential source, a friend of mine, he says, that's exactly what you said it is. It's coming, it's going to hit us, it's going to hit us hard. And there's going to be 200 mile an hour winds. And there's going to be massive tidal waves and earthquakes and all the rest of all the things that you said. Scientists are telling us we're heading into a new ice age? What? The Earth is warming. On what timescale? This year was the hottest year ever. 
Was that before or after NASA and the NOAA altered the temperature record to make recent years warmer? Recent research, however, suggests that there is a possibility that this gradual global warming could lead to a relatively abrupt slowing of the ocean's thermal haline conveyor, that's the Gulf Stream, ladies and gentlemen, which could lead to harsher winter conditions, sharply reduced soil moisture, and more intense winds in certain regions that currently provide a significant fraction of the world's food production with inadequate preparation. The result could be a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. That means people are going to die. That's what that means. What will be happening in the future with abrupt climate change? The science fiction is what's going to cause it. And the science fiction is human activity creating CO2 greenhouse gases. That's the science fiction. And quite frankly, because you can do this from your home if you've got internet access, there's buoys out there in the Atlantic that give 24-hour, seven-day-a-week readings of the ocean temperature. And anybody can do this any place. You don't need to be on a little island off the coast of Scotland. And they're watching the temp ocean temperature. And then there's a dramatic drop in temperature on one buoy, then another buoy, and so forth. And what they're watching is the North Atlantic Thermal Hailing Conveyor, which is also called the Gulf Stream. Just a couple of years ago, there was an announcement that the Gulf Stream had slowed down by 30%. My private sources tell me it's been more than that. ClimateGate was hype and it's been debunked. The UK Information Commissioner found the ClimateGate scientists guilty of breaking the law by hiding data from the public. What we're going to learn today is known by the major world governments. I doubt the president of Zimbabwe knows what we're going to talk about. But the heads of England, Canada, United States, Russia, China, they all know. And they're making preparations. The Vatican knows, and I have some local uh, connections there that I know how, about the Vatican and what they're doing. It's it's coming, it's going to hit us, it's going to hit us hard. And it's going to be 200 mile an hour winds. And it's going to be massive tidal waves and earthquakes and all the rest of all the things that you said. Because I did pretty quickly learn what would be causing the rising ocean levels and abrupt climate change. These men. At the Arkansas Missouri Ozarks are one of the known safe havens when all these events take place. If you want to get to the heart of a matter, that's the way it's done. You find witnesses who don't know each other that have the same information, and you interview them at different times, different places. On one of the breaks, I have a man walk up and introduce himself to me. He says, John, I'm in the insurance industry. And we've wondered for years, us in the insurance industry, why is there such a cluster of retired Navy people in the zip codes of the Arkansas, Missouri Ozarks? Now I know. Now I got my answer. The Navy knows. Another pistol student of mine, retired Navy guy, I said, uh, what's the altitude of your new home? He told me to the foot the altitude of his new home. How many people can do that? Almost nobody. He told me to the foot the altitude of his new home in the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozarks. How many planets are there in our solar system? Nine? Okay. NASA. Never a straight answer. NASA. <laughs> July 29th, 2005, announced the finding of the 10th planet, named Xena. Do a Google search. They did. Don't take my word for it. NASA announced the finding of the 10th planet, named Xena, 29th of July, 2005. Parade Magazine and the Sunday newspaper. It was a front cover of the January 15th, 2006 edition. Models project a temperature increase of over 2 degrees this century. And these same models overestimated warming over the past 15 years by 400%. After the NASA press announcement in July of 2005, he calls me up and he says, John, you're not crazy. There really is a 10th planet. <laughs> NASA said so. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. There has to be a cause. The cause is the 10th planet. Now, what NASA is calling the 10th planet is not the 10th planet we're concerned about. It's the 10th planet that's referred to in the Bible, also called Wormwood. The closer you are to the current equator, whatever that might be, the better off you are when these things happen, if there's a pole shift, because your climate's not going to change all that much. If you're in Miami, Florida, and we have a 20-degree pole shift, you're not going to end up with a really, really bad winter. You're going to have a mild winter. But if you're in Maine, and you got a 20-degree pole shift, you could end up with the weather of Siberia real easy. 
And when this 10th planet comes through our solar system every 3,600 years, it just causes severe problems on our planet, interacting with the Earth electrically and with gravity both. Climate denial is a well-funded conspiracy. Actually, the real money is to be made in global warming alarmism. Professor James McCanning, who is a credentialed scientist, has written a number of books on this. He's a real astrophysical scientist, and he knows about this stuff. I'm a private detective and a researcher. I'm not a scientist. But I can tell you what the scientists say, because I've read their books. And I can tell you what... Dr. Uh, Velikowski said, because I've read his books. And I can tell you what the Bible says, because I've read the Bible. And all these things are true, and all these things are in the process of happening right now. Where is all this water going to come from? Up until last year, I was thinking, oh, melting ice at Antarctica, melting ice at Greenland. But that, how could it melt that fast? Well, it can't melt that fast, even with what we're going through. It turns out the answer was right in front of me all the time. There is a bulge of water at the equator. It turns out that sea level varies as much as 494 feet up and down from that rock in Cornwall, England. Now that's like a 50-story building. I mean, it's a lot of water. And there's a bulge of literally millions of cubic miles, cubic miles, one mile by one mile by one mile, cubic miles, millions of cubic miles of water bulge at the equator of this planet. It wasn't common knowledge for John Moore, I found out. It may, it's not common knowledge for most people. It's held in place by two things, the rotation of the Earth and gravity. Anything that changes our true north, our pole, by more than just a couple of degrees, will cause that water to be disrupted. And there's a technical term for it, slush. <laughs> and there's records locked up in bones and stone of this having happened in the past. Velikowski talked about it extensively in his books. Now, from Washington, D.C. to Boston is basically one big city. All that's going to be gone. Going down the coast to Atlanta and down to Florida. Florida, the highest point in Florida is on the panhandle, 55 feet above sea level. Florida's finished, except for a small part of the isthmus, maybe. And that's a big maybe. Gulf Coast, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi are pretty much going to be gone. In fact, the new mouth of the Mississippi will be at the current Arkansas-Louisiana state line, a couple hundred miles up from where it is right now. Going down around the coast of Texas, Texas will take damage about 100 miles inland. California will take damage 25 to 100 miles inland, depending on a couple of things, the level of the altitude above sea level and seismic activity. On up the west coast to Oregon and Seattle, all coastal areas being damaged 50 to 100 miles inland. And once again, seismic activity is going to play a big role in what happens. Locally in the Midwest, we have something called the New, Ma New, Madrid Seism New Madrid Seismic Zone. Once the Mississippi River becomes 50 to 100 miles wide, the U.S. Navy, not John Moore, the U.S. Navy says it will trigger th at least three nine-point-plus earthquakes on the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Southern Illinois will basically be on one large swamp. In fact, Southern Illinois is already pretty swampy. If you fly over the Mississippi River right now, you can see where the river used to be. You can see where its banks were at one time. A much, much larger river than it is now. It's from Time Magazine, Monday, June 24th, 1974. Yes, to quote the title of Penn and Teller's TV series, this video will look at bullshit, or to put it more politely, urban myths that have grown up around the subject of climate change. Now, the real timeline. These relocations, which you could call evacuations, are due to have everybody who's part of continuity of government planning. It's not all federal employees. If you work for Health and Human Services, you're toast. There's no place waiting for you in Denver. People in the intelligence agencies, people in certain parts of the military, not all the military. The scientists, the engineers, the doctors that they want to have in these shelters 
when everything breaks loose. That's who's being relocated, that's who's being sent to these shelters. These shelters are literally hundreds of millions of your tax dollars where people can live and work and have hot showers and pizzas and video movies for years whatever, without ever leaving the place and be quite comfortable. And now what we sometimes refer to as a New World Order, which will be uh, basically corporations running everything, banks and corporations, they fully expect to come out on the other side of this intact. The agendas of the people that control the world, the international bankers and the Fortune 500 and so forth, is to have a planet with far less people on it than there is now, either inadvertently through these earth changes or by design through World War III, a flu pandemic, or severe economic collapse leading to societal disruption, or all three happening at the same time. What we're living in right now is as phase one. Phase one is where normal commerce takes place. We can have our careers, interact with our families and, and our social events that we normally do. And life appears to be normal. The powers that be are using phase one to finish their final preparations. Phase two will be when these earth changes events, abrupt climate change, bizarre weather, earthquakes, tidal waves, all become so numerous that they become daily news. In fact, when I meet people out in the street, uh, almost everybody comments on how bizarre the weather has become. And that's pretty much a topic of daily discussion. The government, the powers that be, will claim that these bizarre weather-related events are related to global warming. And when they're happening, that we need to start cutting back on our creation of CO2 greenhouse gases. As these events become more severe, you're going to hear more and more men with lab coats from NASA talking about global warming being caused by human activity and that it will be better and everything's going to be okay so you can go back to your baseball games and go back to work Monday morning. Things are going to be fine. That's phase two. As I looked at the science of climate change and real research done by experts on both sides of the issue. Now it's the turn of the amateurs. Now I love Penn and Teller and I appreciate that bullshit is supposed to be entertainment. But this claim also pops up in internet blogs and even mainstream media. This is Time magazine in 1975. Another ice age is coming. We're all going to die. And this is Senator James Inhofe, who not only cites Time, but also this 1975 story in Newsweek. George Will cites a 1975 article in the New York Times. And Michael Crichton makes the claim on page 315 of his book, State of Fear. In the 1970s, he writes, all the climate scientists believed an ice age was coming. But these are all popular newspapers, magazines, and novels, not scientific journals. It's from Time magazine. So what, Penn? Time magazine isn't peer-reviewed. It's just as capable of misreporting and sensationalizing stories as any other magazine. Don't just take my word for it. Read the story and tell me exactly where this claim about an ice age comes from. Five people, all scientists, were named in the story. They all agreed that the Earth had been cooling. Sure, that was evident from the temperature data. But not one of them substantiated time's line of an impending ice age. And one of them even said the period of cooling was about to end. So where did time get the idea an ice age was coming? Well, the magazine had to resort to an old journalist trick of inventing a pack of unnamed and unquoted sources. Climatological Cassandras are becoming increasingly apprehensive. That may be. But why couldn't Time magazine find one of these climatological Cassandras? Perhaps because they weren't as numerous as the headline and the hype suggest. The question is, how many climatologists in the 1970s did accept this conclusion of a coming ice age? If you want to find out, it's no good thumbing through Time and Newsweek. Boring as it sounds, you have to look at the scientific literature. Phase three will be a relatively short period of time. It may be a matter of a few days, maybe a week. It won't be long. 
At some point, people will realize that things are very strange and very dangerous, and they'll start doing things they normally wouldn't do. Most men, and it's mostly men because of the nature of the work they do, some women, who know about what we're talking about today just simply go about their lives and keep quiet about it. They're not public speakers. They take care of their family. They take care of themselves. And the rest of you are on your own. Phase four will be the end of the world as we know it. Once these oceans come up, the infrastructure that supports normal human activity will be wiped out. The housing where 100 million people live will be damaged and or destroyed. The potable water that these people rely on will no longer be potable. The food that they rely on to eat will no longer be available. It will not be a pretty picture. Martial law will be instituted probably before that, which brings to mind these other scenarios. What are you looking at? You're looking at curfews. The curfew could be from 10 o'clock at night to 6 a.m. The curfew could be 24 hours a day. Restrictions of sales of uh, firearms, ammunition, and alcohol. Rest uh, rationing of fuel, rationing of food. Potable water rationing. Possibly uh, rationing of electricity. We've seen that in Iraq a lot, depending on what's going on. Martial law is not a fun thing to be part of or live under, even if you're part of the occupying force because it changes your life. And the Navy says these oceans will come up over a period of about 30 days. Once these events get in motion, these water levels, these oceans, these tsunamis, tidal waves will take place over a period of about one month. Altitude. The Navy says that everything 100 feet sea level and below will be completely destroyed. The Navy says everything at 400 feet and below is at risk of being damaged and or destroyed. But there's more to this. There is how close you are to densely populated areas. Now, the Appalachian Mountains, for example, in North Carolina and so forth, would be highly desirable places to be if it wasn't for being so close to literally tens of million people who are going to be hungry and without potable water and without electricity. That's what makes those areas undesirable, even though they will be safe in terms of geology and rising ocean levels. Dollars, if you, can, if you call dollars money, uh, you would be well advised to maybe be looking at something else for money to store up value for future use, possibly gold coins, possibly silver coins, to store up a lot of value in a compact area, compact space. Before, however, I would get gold coins or silver coins, I think I would look at other aspects of preparedness. That's why I want to focus on the final part of this presentation is preparedness. So let's look at the stepping stones, the building blocks of preparedness. First of all, and most important, is spiritual preparedness. That our American POWs who were incarcerated in POW camps in World War II, our American POWs who had strong spiritual beliefs, were far more likely to survive what went on in POW camps than those who did not. Eating the same food, having the same medical attention, doing the same work, wearing the same clothes, living in the same buildings. Those who had a strong spiritual foundation were far more likely to survive those conditions. We know that for a fact. It's not my job to tell you what your spiritual beliefs should be. My job is to tell you you need to have strong spiritual beliefs, whatever that might be for you. Next comes skills. The skills of a farmer, a gardener. You will be growing your own food. The skills of a paramedic. In a future where things no longer work like we're used to, you're going to be your own paramedic or, or you're going to sit there and watch your loved one bleed to death from a chainsaw accident or whatever it might be. An EMT course is one semester at your local junior college, maybe $100, $200, and you'll know more about emergency medical matters than 99% of the people in this country one semester at your local junior college. You don't need to worry about passing a test unless you intend to be a paramedic or EMT. You don't need to worry about taking a test at all. You want to learn the skills, and you want to get a kit equal to your skill level. Now, the paramedic training is three more, three more semesters of college on top of that first one, and then you'll have 
a skill level almost equal to a medical doctor when it comes to emergency medical treatment. The skills of a ham radio operator. I've been in places, I've been in combat, and I know what it's like not to know what's going on. Being able to instantly and effectively communicate with your friends and loved ones, and we found this out during Hurricane Katrina, two-way radio communication that you control could mean the difference between life and death. In Hurricane Katrina, it was a matter of life and death for many people. The ability to communicate with their loved ones, let them know they were okay, ask for help, or be able to give help. The skills of a backpacker, being able to carry everything you need on your back, your shelter, your clothing, your hygiene needs, being able to clean yourself out in the field, prepare food out in the field, and do so in a manner that doesn't make you sick. Being able to take water out of a stream and filter it so you can drink it without getting sick. All the things that a backpacker knows, the skills of a soldier. In a severe crisis like Hurricane Katrina, for example, you're your own cop, you're your own soldier, or nobody's protected. That's what it comes down to. You become your own soldier, you become your own police officer, and you protect your loved ones because of these skills that you learn. Animal husbandry. In a severe long-term crisis, having goats and sheep and chickens and ducks and rabbits can mean the difference between a fairly good and healthy diet and one that's terribly lacking in protein. It's extremely difficult to get the protein you need from an all-vegetable diet. Extremely difficult. The skills of a carpenter, of an electrician, of a plumber, things that we may call up a professional to do now, you, you will be on your own to make these repairs. The skills of an automobile mechanic. All these skills take years to learn, and you can't learn them out of a book, at least not and be very effective. There's some things you can learn out of a book, but without practical application, you're just guessing at how this stuff works. The first thing you notice is an admission from a lot of scientific bodies that there was great uncertainty about the climate in the 1970s. Okay, but was there any kind of consensus? Well, if all or most climate scientists were predicting another ice age back in the 1970s, there should be lots of scientific papers from that time supporting that conclusion. After all, there are hundreds of scientific papers today supporting anthropogenic climate change. A review published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society looked at the scientific literature rather than the popular press. Three climatologists searched scientific journals between 1965 and 1979, and yes, they found seven papers predicting not an ice age, but global cooling. The only problem is they also found 44 articles predicting global warming. Even though the world was cooling in the 1970s and had been for three decades, even so, six times as many climatologists predicted that the danger was global warming, not global cooling. For the purposes of propagating an urban myth, the claim about a consensus on an imminent ice age simply does the rounds unchecked, even when it's dressed up as science. I mentioned Wisconsin will be gone. The Great Lakes will become one vast inland sea joining up with Hudson Bay up in Canada. That's what the Navy says. Gone, Wisconsin's gone. It's finished. There's, no, there's not going to be any more Wisconsin. Florida's gone. Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, finished, gone. Some science in there, some science fiction. The science is about what will happen in the future, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The science fiction is what's causing it. It's not man-made greenhouse gases, like he says. That's a distraction. And that tactic was decided on many, many years ago, um, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, that they would use that as the pretext to keep people thinking things are going to be OK. The science leaves out something, and the science fiction adds something. Al Gore gives a timeline for when these events are going to happen. Abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. The timeline that Al Gore gives in his movie is the same timeline that, line that the federal government gives out through the, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute. Say that fast ten times. The NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute, which the Queen, Her Majesty, visited last spring when she was in this country, by the way, because she's got a sudden, taking a sudden interest in science. It's kind of clever what they did in the movie, the way they said it. But in 2016, things will start to get bad, abrupt climate change and rising ocean levels. 
Exact same timeline put out by the federal government through NASA. NASA is part of the military, by the way. If you notice these space flight shuttles go up, Captain this, Lieutenant that, Colonel, I mean, it's the military. It's always been the military. That's the official timeline put up by the federal government. 